So I'm now going to pass it over to Jenny Trainer, Associate Curator at the Museum and one of the curators for the Paper Routes Women to Watch 2020 edition. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Mary. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Once again, um, you are in for a fantastic treat. I think I say that every time, but it's always true. Um, I am the co-curator of Paper Roots Women to Watch 2020, along with my colleague, Assistant Curator Orin Zara. And just a, a few brief words about the exhibition series. Um, this Women to Watch series has been going on since 2008, and it is a collaboration between the museum and our outreach committees, which we have across the country, as well as in Europe and uh, South America. We have 22 participating committees this time around, so it's our largest Women to Watch ever. Um, it will be the majority of our second floor galleries. And when I think about where it started in 2008, it was a handful of, of committees um, represented by one artist each in just one gallery um, at the museum. So it's grown really exponentially. It grows every year and it's really um, one of my favorite projects to work on at the museum. So I would uh, like to begin, as always, is extending our thanks and appreciation to the UK Friends of NIMLA under the leadership of Susan Zimney for all of their incredible support throughout this process, which has been much more complicated than usual this time around uh, because of the global pandemic. The UK Friends put on a splendid exhibition of all their nominated artists last September at Sotheby's that included an evening with the artists in the gallery. And if I knew then what I know now, I would have moved heaven and earth to have gone to that. <laughs> I'm really regretting that I didn't go, uh, but it sounds like it was wonderful. I also would like to thank Natasha Howes of the Manchester Art Gallery, who served as the committee's consulting curator and brought the work of Mary Evans and the other selected artists um, to our attention at NIMWA. This is always, um, it's kind of like Christmas, receiving all these um, submissions and all these nominated artists because um, I, I feel like it's, you know, this is such a true collaborative effort between um, so many moving parts that, you know, relying on the expertise of curators in these respective areas, you know, we come across artists who we never, you know, we probably wouldn't know otherwise. Um, so it's really a, a true collaboration and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Um, I always like to stress that the Women to Watch exhibition series, it's not a competition per se. Um, it's really about organizing and curating a cohesive exhibition around the given theme, which of course this year is paper. Um, to showcase the variety of approaches. And so um, Maureen and I, as, as the overall curators for this show, when selecting one artist from each committee, we're not, we're not looking for, quote unquote, the best artist, whatever that means anyway, but rather um, we're, we're looking to present a wide range of works in size and scale and technique and um, I think that we've really accomplished that this year, and I'm really excited that the exhibition is going on. It's been delayed a little bit, but we are opening on October 8th, so I'm very happy for that. So I'd like to introduce Mary Evans to you. Uh, Mary has a very impressive um, resume and biography. She studied painting at the Gloucestershire College of Arts and Technology and received her MFA from Goldsmiths College. She completed her postgraduate study at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam, which we were just chatting a bit about. Mary has been a recipient of the Arts and Liter Literary Arts Residency at the Rockefeller Foundation in Bellagio, Italy in 2014, a research residency at Dubois Centre Accra in Ghana in 2013, and the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship at the National Museum of African Art here in Washington, D.C. in 2010. In addition to being featured last fall at the Sotheby's exhibition, Women to Watch UK Paperwork, Mary's work has been presented at Ireland's 2016 Biennial, the Blaffer Art Museum in Houston, Texas, um, Tiwani Contemporary in London, and closer to home here in Baltimore in 2008, she had a solo exhibition um, titled Meditations. And Mary is um, currently represented, I believe, by Tiwani Contemporary in London. 
So with that, I will turn it over to Mary, um, who will be speaking about her work. And um, I am very excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn and Ginny. And thank you so much for having me, for having me this, um, this I, was, I was just about to say this evening, but it's afternoon for you, but um, um, to, in my studio, and also for, um, you know, so, uh, for the UK committee, thank you so much for selecting me to be their woman to watch for the Paper Roots exhibition. I'd really like to also spend, send special thanks to Beth Colocci and Claire Manda for their support. Um, I think it's a year now since uh, the Sotheby's exhibition and um, and yeah through everything that's happened over the last six months we were, everything was up and down but it's, it's great that it's happening and I'm so happy to say that I sent the work last Thursday so it's not actually here you can't see it I'll have an image of it at the end of my um, my slideshow so I'm going to just um, share my screen now and just show quite a few images because I think it's quite important that I show um, images of previous work so that people get an idea of kind of how my practice with paper came about because it came at, out of a direct result of my painting practice and I think it's quite important for the people to understand that. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. It worked when we practiced so it better work now. I'll try it. Um, and it's there and share. And I'm just going to put it on, on there. Okay, good. So I'll start off, um, as Jeannie said, I, I studied painting for both my, my BA um, and my MA at Goldsmiths. Uh, I was always a painter. Um, well, at least I thought I was, <laughs> anyway. And I was always really interested in objects. I, I used to kind of say that I painted still lives, but in a way, but, but without the tabletop and, the, and all that. It was just all, just the things. And they're always floating around like this in, in midair. And, um, and to some extent, that, that kind of aspect of my work hasn't really changed. So I was always interested in painting things. And I, and, I, and I painted them in this way that was very quick, very kind of um, simple. Uh, I, I kind of call them pictograms, pictographic work, um, kind of hieroglyphic kind of painting. Uh, after Goldsmiths, I went to Amsterdam and I was there for four years. I, um, I spent two years at the Wrights Academy doing a, what they call a postgraduate residency. And when I was there, I really got much more into pictograms and the pictographic visual language. One of my tutors there gave me this incredible folder of the, the two images on either side of the painting or from there of um, international signs and symbols that I, I'm sure that everybody's aware of. We all know, we all understand. It's a visual language that wherever you are in the world, you can find your way around, you know, you know in, in, a, in an airport or a train station or whatever. And I, and I started to use that much more in earnest and the, the piece in the middle is a painting that I made kind of based on that language. I call it a painting, but it's actually stencils. So that's something that is, um, that I was always a printmaker. I, I, printmaking and painting were, were equal kind of um, loves of mine when I was at college. And my degree show for my BA was actually half and half, half printmaking, half painting. But then when I was painting like this, I, I, I painted in what I call an offset way. So I painted by making stencils and masks. I, used, I started making them with brown paper, but that, that wasn't very sustainable. The paper would get soggy with paint and ink. So I switched to plastic, very thin plastic. And I would kind of make these paintings by not painting. So I'd put masks on the, on the canvas and then I'd pull them off. And for some reason, I never, I wouldn't throw them away. I would keep these masks and stencils that I pulled off my canvases. Something told me to hang on to them. Not quite sure why. Um, I think I, I always felt restricted by the, the frame of the canvas, by the size of the canvas. So I would stick them onto the wall. This is in the Wrights Academy project room that I used quite a lot when I was there. And I felt much more at home making moving these things around in a space where I wasn't restricted by the size of the stretcher and I was only restricted by the scale of the architecture. And gradually, this is kind of where my, my 
paper um, wall work started from, from these kind of um, interventions that I was doing. Um, but I, I had a couple of um, experiences in Amsterdam. So, so on the one, one hand, Amsterdam was fantastic for me in that I found my medium. You know, I came back, from Lon back to London from Amsterdam with a practice um, with a strong medium that I had discovered, but also with a kind of reason or, a, or the content. So I came back with form and content. So a couple of things happened, all both based around my identity as um, a Nigerian born, UK um, raised person, artist that was questioned a couple of times when I was living in Amsterdam. And um, once by the Dutch and once by the British. Um, the Dutch kept making me go and get my passport stamped, um, not believing, I don't know why, maybe because my passport, even though I'm a British citizen, I was born in, in Nigeria. So for that reason, they, they kept making me go back to, to make sure that I was eligible to be there. And another time, same passport was stolen. So I went to the British embassy and they didn't believe that I was British. So I had to prove that I was British, which was really hard to do in 1991 before, you know, internet and all that kind of stuff. I, I mean, I, I managed it in the end, but in that period of time, I started to think about who I was and where I was and where I belonged and where, um, who I paid allegiance to. So I started making these paintings that were all red, white and blue and they were made in the same way. So every single thing that you see there has been cut out of plastic and stuck onto the canvas. The top one is canvas and the bottom one is actually board. And they were called my standard paintings. Um, standard as in standardized visual language, but standard as in a, a standard is another word for flag. And so with the combination of the, the, the form that I had discovered and the content that I had discovered, I just kind of took off and started making this work that is more familiar to people who know my work now. So this is the first wall piece that I made based on the painting that I showed before and using the whole space, you know, the architecture of this room. Um, this is just brown paper that we all know. It's cheap and cheerful and it's stuck onto the wall with wallpaper paste and it stays there for as long as, um, as long as you want, for as long or as little time as you want. You know, if you, if you imagine wallpaper in your home, it stays up there until the next time you redecorate. Um, so in, the, in a sense, it's strong, but in another sense, it's fragile, which is really kind of important in, um, in relation to the imagery that I make work about, that I, it, that I work with, um, which is generally, it, it's changed from this time. My, my work has become much more, the figures that I use have become much more realistic, but um, very much to do with the resilience and strength, yet fragility, of the black body. That's kind of what my, my practice is, is generally talking about. And I'm not going to talk about every single image, um, but it's just the, the next few images just show you various permutations of the way that I work. So every now and then I'll come across a situation where I'm not allowed to paste on the wall of a gallery or a museum for conservation reasons for you know it might be a protected building a listed building so I have to find another way to work and which I really enjoy because it really pushes me to think about other ways that I can work with paper so you know this is a, uh, a installation in Leighton House Museum in Kensington and, and I wasn't allowed to paste on the wall so I, I made these kind of paper wall hangings this is another piece where I wasn't allowed to paste on the walls and I made this kind of what looks like a massive great big lantern but it's it's just paper that I've cut out of that's hanging from um, a skylight in, a, in the gallery space. The, um, this image just shows you some of the things that I look at um, in relation to you know the research that I do so things like the the, the brooks which the top image of the of how enslaved Africans were packed onto slave ships and in the bottom left is, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Blake, William Blake um, engraving of um, an enslaved African woman being whipped. And then there's a, a ship's hold and then there's a, an African, a Ghanaian figure. So I, I kind of look at some of these things like the Ghanaian figure and, uh, and other figures um, kind of um, 
carvings and things, the things that I grew up with at home in North London, you know, just things that were on our mantelpiece, you know, on the shelf. And, you know, I just kind of grew up knowing them, but not necessarily appreciating them at the time. And um, one of the, um, I traveled, I've been lucky enough to get a couple of um, Arts Council awards to travel um, as part of the research for my work. And one of the, one of the kind of key, I suppose, interests of mine is the, the is Britain's imperial history, the transatlantic slave trade, and the, the psychogeography of the transatlantic slave trade. So the places where the sites where these these things happen. So um, in two thousand and six, five and six, I went to Ghana and visited um, castles there, and I also went to some of the states of uh, America. I went to Virginia. South Carolina and Georgia and visited plantations and then there are images here of Liverpool and Bristol where which were key sites of the trade in the UK. So this is all to just uh, this research is kind of it feeds into my work not always very directly but it's just kind of um, I suppose the scaffolding part of the scaffolding of what I do and every now and then I might be more specific about the research and, and look more specifically at things like in this piece I made a piece of work in, the, in, a, in a gallery called the Stephen Lawrence Gallery, which was named after a young 18 year old boy who was murdered in 1993 in the borough of Greenwich, which is actually where I am, where my studio is. And um, what was interesting for me about this piece of work was that this gallery is, part, is housed in the University of Greenwich and the University of Greenwich is housed in a former maritime hospital. So what I was interested in here was, was the psychogeography in that the architecture here was the same as the architecture on the west coast of Africa in the forts and castles, as you can see from the, the kind of um, the ceiling, the vaulting, which I, I kind of um, show in the work as well. So that was uh, another exhibition in the same year in another gallery space. This is just showing you the details from this piece of work. So these are the Canon and um, the, the, the William Blake image that I showed before and how I have interpreted them on my work. This is a slightly different departure for me in that the black that you see there on, that, on this work is actually printing. You know, going back to one of my first loves, you know, it's printing, it's lino, it's stamping. And it was just appropriate for me to do it for that piece of work. It's not something that I do very often. So like I say, I'm not always allowed to um, paste on the walls. This is in the South Bank Centre in, um, in London, in the Queen Elizabeth Hall, where I made a piece of work to, um, to celebrate the, uh, the events to commemorate the 2007 bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade in Britain. And um, it's a space that had hundreds and hundreds of windows and hardly any walls. So I use the windows and you can probably recognize some of the images that I showed earlier. And it's again, it's plastic. That is one of the first things that I used when I was making work like this. It's just sticky plastic stuck on the window. And, it, and what I like about working in this way and working in the way that I do with brown paper is that the work often looks much more kind of than the sum of its parts. This is literally just plastic stuck on a window but people often think it's um, the great big massive light boxes that I've set into the window and I've lit from behind. There's nothing like that at all. It's, it's all quite, um, quite simple. Some of the reading that I do, um, Tanahisi Coates Between the World and Me was just one of my most kind of favorite recent books in which the author is, it's an epistolary kind of novel in which he writes letters to his 15, his son was 15 at the time, his 15 year old son telling kind of telling his 15 year old son how to navigate this world in a black body. It's an amazing book. And, and in it, he talks about, you know, lots of things, he talks about Du Bois and, you know, the civil rights movement and et cetera, et cetera. It's, only, it's, it's quite a slim volume and he gets all that into this, this amazing kind of um, letter to his son about being careful and, you know, kind of surviving this this world you know in a way uh, the, the the next piece of work i'm going to show you i did in china in 2008 and it's based on this this pottery which is 
called Chinese Blue and White um, Porcelain. And it's something that I grew up with, um, uh, the what was it called? The Willow Pattern Design. And um, a lot of people, I, a lot of my friends' families, you know, had this kind of pottery set um, dinner service at home. And funnily enough, a lot of the people who I, I grew up with on my road were also from somewhere else. And um, we had friends from Jamaica, from India, from Ireland, and we were from Nigeria and we would be running in, in and out of each other's houses. This is in the late 60s, early 70s. And all my friends' families had this dinner service. And it was as though they had all thought to themselves, right, we're British now. We've got to have this British dinner set, <laughs> which I just thought was hilarious. Even as a 10-year-old, I thought that was interesting. And, uh, and the fact that it wasn't British anyway. It was uh, based on the Chinese um, kind of folklore which is kind of half made up, it wasn't really true. But I made this piece of work in 2008 in Guangzhou based on, on that kind of story. But what was interesting about it for me was that it was recognized as a pictorial language. It was um, picked up on by the visitors to the museum in um, Guangzhou and they, they, they understood the blue and white, they, they got it, um, which I thought was interesting. This is in Baltimore that um, Jeannie mentioned, this is Baltimore Museum of Art also in 2008 where I had access to the African art collection and um, I just kind of mined the collection for images and objects and things and made this kind of funny um, patterned wallpaper out of it. My work used, used to be much more decorative and ornamental than it is now. Um, it's not so much now, but I still think that the, the graphic, the ornamental, the decorative is still part of my thinking and part of the way that I, that I work. This is the first time I ever made a piece of work that was um, where my figures, the figures that I used were life size. And this was actually at Tiwani um, Contemporary in 2012 in a solo show that I had there called Cut and Paste. And it's a remake of the piece I showed earlier in the Stephen Lawrence Gallery. And, be, and it, I, I only made it because I had the opportunity. I had a big enough wall to do it. I didn't see the point in putting anything else on a wall like that. So I made this work with these large figures. It's called Held. And um, the, the idea being that you are literally held in front of this work. You, you are the same size as those figures. You know, the, the tallest male figures are, I think, eight foot two, oh, eight, not eight foot, six foot two. And so you can stand there and you can feel as though you can walk into this place, into the, into the hold. It's the hold of the, um, the, the slave forts in Ghana. Just to show you where I get my images from really, I just look on the online and I find images of, uh, I, I have to be really careful with what I put into the Google search, as you can imagine, I get all sorts of things come up. Um, but um, my figures are always, always nude. I, I, I just don't want to get bogged down with clothing and with with what that would do with the, the dating that would happen with that, you know, the, the kind of, the, it, how it would fix the work in, to, in a certain point in a certain time. So they're always nude. Um, and then I, I just kind of tweak and change things and, you know, change facial um, features and hair and that kind of thing when I do my actual work. In between making these big, big installations, I, I, I work with paper in other ways. So these are doilies. I don't know what you, do you call doilies doilies in America? I don't know, but they're, you know, these kind of things that you put cakes on. And, and I, we grew up with those, you know, um, on Sundays, <laughs> we would have cakes on, on doilies. So I, I just have drawers full of them. And, um, and I like them because they're already decorative. And then I just use them as a kind of template on which to, to make little vignettes, little stories out of them. These were very much based on the, when I was doing the, the Chinese kind of um, work, the blue and white porcelain work. Sometimes my work is practically invisible. This is in Dubai in 2013, and you can probably see the work, it's up high. But I, what I liked about that was that the, the building at the, the um, uh, Art Dubai, the art fair, the building was so ornate that um, my work kind of just slotted in. It was as ornate as the building, you know, the kind of Islamic architecture with all the, the tiling and the fretwork and the, the this kind of symmetrical um, pattern making. It just kind of slotted right in there. And these are paper doilies, but they're, 
they're what are called tray papers. They're much bigger kind of doilies for catering. These are paper plates. Um, I have an ongoing collect, um, piece of work called Recollections, where I, I kind of commemorate um, African um, figures, historical figures onto these plates. We have this tradition in the UK of, um, maybe you have it in the States as well, of commemorating events on ceramic plates. Usually, you know, like with the royal family, with somebody in the royal family sneezes, they, you know, put out a plate or a tea towel or something. And um, so I just um, kind of co-opted that trope. And uh, every now and then I, I, I make, it's an ongoing thing. I started making them in 2011 and um, keep doing them. I've got some I can show you afterwards. There's some up on the wall in the studio as well. And, um, and I don't think I've said so yet, but the paper, um, the disposability of the paper that I use is really important in it, it, it kind of feeds into what I have always have often felt and other, other people have felt to be the disposability of the black body. So it feeds into that. And that's kind of why I use paper. Um, people often say to me, oh, but you know, what, what remains of your work of an installation? Well, nothing, you know, it's a, it's made for a particular place for a particular moment. I have made a couple of things in the past that are permanent and they're still there and, you know, but generally speaking, the work is, is disposable, is as disposable as the narratives that I'm telling. This was in, um, in Limerick, in a at Ava in 2016. So the, these images are from a few years ago now of the kind of what was called the refugee crisis. Um, the people kind of crossing the Mediter Mediterranean to get to um, France and, and, and the UK. And I used the, some of these images to make, to make my, this work, um, you know, I'm interested in diaspora and this, this show was in Ireland and I grew up with Irish people and there are often lots of connections between, you know, the African diaspora and the Irish diaspora. And um, um, yeah, I, I grew up knowing people who had come, you know, I grew up in Northwest London, which had at the time, not so much now, a huge Irish population. So I really wanted to make this, this piece of work in Ireland, and which is something that I try to do wherever I, whenever I can, like I did in China, is I like to try and connect with the local community in some way through my work. So this is just showing you other things that I do with paper. This is, um, these are vignettes. I mean, these are a bit twee. Uh, you know, a bit cute and, and, and all that. And um, sometimes I, I'm, I'm not always sure about this work. It's quite different from the big kind of installation work. And I use tools like paper drills and things like that and stencils and, and templates that I make to make this work. But I, I make them every now and then. It's a kind of, I feel as though I'm just keeping my hand in when I make things like this. This is more recent. These are the, my do not bends. Um, which I find, um, to me, they're, they're quite interesting pieces of work. They're made out of envelopes. Um, we call these envelopes hardback envelopes in the UK. Um, it's, you know, a hardboard envelope and it's got that printed, do not bend. It's for sending, you know, fragile things to the post. And I have always, had always sworn that I would never use text in my work. It's never been something that I've been interested in because I've always been interested in the power of the visual language and, and the, the need to not have, not to use text. But this just seemed appropriate for this, for me in this, this instance. Um, the, the implication being that, you know, black bodies are as fragile, as strong or as fragile as other bodies, but just be careful. It's like a polite notice. Please do not bend, you know, just be careful. This is in Amsterdam. It was really nice to go back to Amsterdam actually in 2016 and make a piece of work that is permanently there after having lived there all those years ago it's really nice to just be there for a week and and make um and worked for a commission for a law firm this is in brazil in um also 2016 um again a piece of work that i, I tried to connect with the with the place it was the the 11th biennale um de mercosol in um, porto alegre in brazil and um, so you can see here, I've incorporated figures doing capoeira, you know, kind of the capoeira martial arts and, 
And I've just, uh, you, I don't know if you can see, because I can't see it because my thing's in the way. Oh yeah, you can see the arch in the top corner. That comes from the local park. The city park has this arch come at the, cent at the um, entrance to the park commemorating, um, um, it's a memorial for war dead and um, previous um, citizens of the city. And the park is called Redemption Park. So this piece of work is called Redemption. Um, oh, what's happened? Oh, this is a piece of work that I made in, um, in Lagos in 2000 and, oh gosh, I can't remember, 18, 19? And I hadn't been, at that point, I had not been back to Lagos for 22 years or something. So it was great for me to go there and make a piece of work in the city that I was born in. And even though I, I lived there for a couple of years in my teens, it was a really good thing for me to just to be there and to make work. Because a lot of the images that I use are, uh, or, or a lot of the, the little vignettes and stories that I tell are kind of memories such as sitting down, having your hair done by, by your mum or your auntie. So I always have little stories like that that you can kind of see um, going on. Um, another thing is that I, my, you know, I, I, I went to, to art school in Europe, in England and in, in Holland. You know, I was kind of taught kind of Western tradition of fine art. And um, so you can see glimpses of you know, Dejeuner Soulève and, um, you know, classical kind of um, French painting, etc. in the poses, like the, you know, um, that I use in the work. And it's just that the, the, the body is, is a different body, but the, you know, the classicism is the same. Coming up to more recent work in, this is in Plymouth, um, in the Plymouth Institute, uh, a couple of, oh no, last year, 2019, I've, I've got so mixed up with when things are. This is the first time that I actually made work that incorporated other objects into, into my kind of storytelling. So I looked at some objects in the museum in Plymouth called The Box and incorporated them into my, my work. Paper, photographic versions of them, as you can see here. So on the left is a, is a, is a silver, Oh, I don't know what to call it. Uh, thing, <laughs> ornament. It's, it's Drake's cup. So Francis Drake's cup. So um, apparently, um, and I quite liked placing it with that young, with that baby as a kind of giant rattle that it might be playing with. Um, and then somebody's holding a, an umbrella, a parasol, and somebody's holding a fan. This, this show um, was on in La Banque in um, Bethune in Northern France, and then it had to close for, because of the pandemic, but it's recently opened again and it's been extended. And this is just a beautiful space. It's a really amazing art center. My work um, was on the floor that, it, uh, so the building was a former bank and my floor was the, the bank manager's apartment. And it's that ornate, that's what it looks like. And I just really wanted to use the architecture of the, of the space with the work in a, in a kind of seamless way, you know, uh, and it just kind of seemed to fit really well. This is another one of the rooms. That piece of work that you can see there on the table is a gingerbread men version of the, um, of the slave ship. So I drew the ship, the diagram that we know, quite well and then I made 500 gingerbread men and placed them onto the diagram of the ship in much the same way as the as you see when you look at those um, historical images and that's the dining room of the apartment so I made them for that space and this is prospect so this is what I'm going to show in um, in the museum in DC uh, this is just a, an illustrator kind of image of it. This is what it hopefully will look like. Um, and for, for me, the idea of this piece of work was, so like I said before, you know, I like to connect with the place, um, with the space, with the history of, of wherever I'm, I might be showing. And, and I spent a really fantastic time in Washington DC in 2010 as a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow. Um, at the National Museum of African Art. And 
and I really got to like Washington. And I used to just go and do all the touristy things, you know, uh, go to the White House and just have a look around. And um, so I wanted to make a piece of work that connected with Washington, D.C. And this, this piece is based kind of on the, what is now, I think, received wisdom that enslaved Africans built the White House or were in, uh, co-opted into, or, you know, into building the White House. And um, so I'm going to have an image of the White House, a slide, it's been decided now. Originally I was going to do, make a silhouette of the White House, but I just feel that um, this, this option of having an image of it is, is better, partly because um, I'm not going to be installing the work myself and, and I know how tricky that would be to install a silhouette of the White House. It would be tricky enough for me to do. But I think that the, the slide works well because I took that photograph of the White House in 2010. So it kind of connects there. And then there's a kind of, you know, maybe the usual array of little stories, little things going on kind of in front of the White House or the White House in the, in the distance. Kind of owning it, I think you, um, it makes me also think of the, um, uh, oh, the, the space in Washington, uh, do you call it the, the, the front lawn? You call it the, I don't know what you call it, where the green is going up to the Capitol. The mall. The mall, the mall yeah, and the it's mall, often yeah. called Americans, America's front lawn. Yes, yeah. And it kind of makes me, it reminds me of that as well. So that mm -hmm. was kind of what I was thinking. When, when I was kind of deciding what to do with this piece of work. So I'm sure it's going to look great and, and you know, the technicians will, will work it out. <laughs> so that's sure. it. That's all the images I've got to show you. Um, I'm kind of up for questions and anything right now. So I escape yeah. from that. Oh, yeah, if, if you like, or if you can stay on it, if you, you know, I can keep it there. I can keep want it. to yeah. move back and forth. Yeah. No, that, that was, um, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, I, I feel um, a little bit guilty in, in hearing you talk more about um, kind of synthesizing architecture of the place where your installations are um, into your work. And I feel guilty that I didn't tell you earlier, but maybe you know this already, that the museum was actually built as a Masonic temple. Oh, what's it? <laughs> she tells me no. Really? No, unfortunately, unfortunately, the the galleries, um, you know, don't don't have any of that original architecture. Don't incorporate that. But the the edifice of of the building and some of the interior spaces. Um, I've been there a couple of times, and it's certainly grand. It's such yes. a grand old building, and I really did get that impression when I when I was there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I miss going in there every day. I bet, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I, I love um, the inclusion of the White House. And um, as you know, we're only three blocks away from it. So it is yeah. very, uh, very relevant. Um, and someone just made the comment on the chat that, um, you know, looking at this work now, it's bringing to mind um, the current protests that are going on yeah. right, right outside the White House. Um, and in fact, I haven't, I haven't been by there lately, but I understand that they've really expanded that perimeter. Right. White House, you can't even really get close to it. Anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was thinking about recent events when I, would, when mm -hmm. I was thinking about this. You know, we've had the Black Lives Matter protests here and in and in the US. So I've included um, position um, poses such as taking the knee and the, the salute and you know they're, they're kind of part they're in there they're, they're part of the kind of fabric of the work and it's something that I like to do uh, depending so so I kind of have to keep my eyes on what's going on you know so I can do that but it, it often things like current events become part of the work, even though I, I'm interested in history and uh, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's a historical and contemporaneous kind of axis to, to the work because that's the axis of my interest in general anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think um, it works beautifully here, kind of that um, 
synchronism between between the past and what's going on today um, yeah. and the the I, I like how it's um how your work here on prospect is you know positioning these bodies against the white house and kind of you know leading us into that contemplation of the use of of enslaved labor um, not only to build the White House, but in fact, um, serving presidents. Yeah. You know, the first the first few presidents. Um, yeah. Had slaves at the White House. So. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the title of this piece, um, Prospect, and if it's if for you it's working on on some different levels as some of your other titles have done. Um. Well, titles are really important for me, they always have been. I, I, I've always titled my work. I've never titled my work untitled. Um, but it's prospects. Um, I was thinking about, about, I mean, yeah, the, the word can mean lots of, has, has various meanings. Um, a, a, a kind of historical um, meaning of the word is view, you know, a prospect um literally a view as in uh, you know capability brown's work was all, were often called prospects and uh, so that was my, my first thinking was just a, a view a kind of vista a landscape you know a scene um but also um thinking about it in terms of the idea of enslaved labor being used the prospect of the enslaved labor being used to build the white house and so it came into that as well you know, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I try not to be too clever with wordplay in my titles, but it, sometimes I can't help myself. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a, a great title. It's very, it's very fitting. Um, we had a question about the size of this work. And I believe, as with um, your other recent work, these are all the big fig the largest figures are all life size. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is... Um, I, I, I can only do meters, sorry. Um, That's okay. <laughs> I think it's 15 meters. It's two seven and a half meter walls. I think that's 60 feet, something like that. Yeah. Um, I can show you, if I, if I, I'm gonna stop showing my screen for a second and I will, um, I'll take you on a little visit. So you can see here, so in my studio, I can only ever do, can you see that? Yes, yeah. So you can see how big, oh, no, I should go back. How big, um, yeah, the things are life size. So I can only ever do tiny little kind of practices or experiments in the studio of, of something that's gonna be much larger. But um, yeah, so, so scale wise, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite, it's life size basically yeah 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 and i should mention that when it's installed at the museum it's actually going to be on two separate walls yeah. and there's kind of a space in between the two walls so yeah kind of continue yeah um we had a question about your silhouettes and that they they all appear to be relatively young figures is that <laughs> do you agree <laughs> with that you. Um, yeah, I would agree with that, but it's something that I, I try, I do try to, um, to find other figures and, and also to find figures of, you know, all shapes and sizes. And it's, it's an ongoing process, really. But um, yeah, um, I do have um, templates of, of other of older figures and, you know, different body types, etc. But yeah, I suppose it does. Yeah, I would, I'll take that as a criticism. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think it's just an observation. It's an observation, but I, I, I get it. Um, and, it, and it's something that I battle with. I, I do have to kind of think to, think to myself, okay, there are other people in the world and, you know, not everyone's between, you know, certain ages. I mean, it was only, a, only I don't know, not that long ago, a few years ago, that I started including children and babies in the world. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I just suddenly, I don't know, I just suddenly thought, hang on a minute, you know, what about children? What about babies? But um, yeah, I have to be careful, like I said, with what I put into Google, you know, so, <laughs> oh, God. you know, so I have to, I have to watch yeah. out when I include children and babies. Yes, yes. I think it's very, really interesting um, 
in, in curating this exhibition and in seeing how different artists are working with paper and that for so many, this, this duality of the material um, is so important. The, the fragility of it, mm. but also the, in, the inherent strength of it. Yeah. Um, and I love, you know, how that carries meaning in, in your work. Mm. Um, and it carries meaning in, in other artists' work in the exhibition in, in different ways. And it's, yeah. it's, really, it's really something. I mean, it is a material that is, is everywhere. Yeah. And something that we don't often think a lot about, but what, where would we be without it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, with the paper that I generally use the most, the brown paper, it literally is something that you throw away. You know, mm -hmm. you really don't give it a second thought. You wrap a parcel in it and send it off. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a throwaway kind of kind of stuff but I over the years of using it I realized that it comes in different colors of brown so I I've, I've been able to utilize that in the work in turn in a in a in terms of the kind of the racial um language in the work mm. so you know the cheaper the paper the 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 pulpier it is and generally speaking the darker it dries so and it behaves differently so mm. there's recycled craft paper there's um what's called true craft, you know, I've kind of got to know all this stuff about craft paper. And that's the other thing, that it's called craft paper. Um, you know, it's not really called brown paper. I think you call it, do you call it butcher paper in America? I think some do. Some people do, yeah. I think there are, there are a number of different terms for it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it comes in different colors and different strengths. And I kind of try to work with the properties of the paper as much as I mm -hmm. can. And, um, and like you say, um, you know, when I'm installing the, the work and, and what, what I did with the, with the work that I sent to you, I sent lots of spares because it happens. You, they'll rip, sometimes it'll rip or if it gets too wet and you haven't put it on the wall yet, a, a, a foot's gonna start ripping off. And yeah. sometimes I just step on it, you know, <laughs> I'd step back and I step on it. It's like, okay. So, but, but, so you have to remember that it, it's, it is fragile, but it is strong. The funniest thing that happens sometimes though, is that I'll, I'll wrap the paper up to send it somewhere and I'll wrap it in brown paper. So mm -hmm. I'm wrapping it in the paper that it's made out of, you know, it always just seems quite funny to me that I'm wrapping it in the, in the stuff that it's made out of. So. I'm, yeah. I'm glad it, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that it comes in different in different shades because someone actually um, was asking about that particularly in the in the Legos work. Oh right. If the figures were actually kind of um, in different shades, or if it was just the lighting. Maybe. No, different colors of paper. Yeah. So you know, sometimes it's just because I might have got it from a different company. Um, but often it's because it's a, a different quality, it's a different weight, and then it'll be a different, slightly different color. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I try to use that as much as I can in the work. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're quickly running out of time, but there are just a few more questions about um, your process. Um, one question is, are, are you hand cutting all of this work yourself and, and what tool do you use? Yeah, I cut everything out with a 10A blade, mm. scalpel blade. And um, I'll just take you over here. So I have this table here, this huge table covered in, ooh, can you see? Yeah. Covered in a cutting mat. That's where I cut everything out. And then, yeah, so I just cut them out. So this is what they like before they get rolled up and sent away. Mm -hmm. so I'll project um, onto the paper on the wall for the very large ones, draw around them roughly, and then finesse the drawing. And then I can cut three, I can cut through three sheets of brown paper at a time. So I'll mm -hmm. always cut three figures out at a time. Yeah, and I have hundreds, so I, you know, there's no way I can be cutting one at a time. But, right. but the cutting, having lots, the repetition is really important. So I think I said before that my work is not as, it's not as ornate 
or as pattern based as it used to be. But I consider the repetition to be part of that, the ornamental and the graphic kind of process. So I'll have the same figure more than once in a piece of work, or I'll have the same figure at three different sizes in a piece of work mm -hmm. to, to show perspective. But yeah, um, some people have been saying to me over the years, why don't you laser cut them? And, but for me, it's something that I haven't actually mentioned yet is craft. The craft is really important for me. Um, the, the, the doing it by hand, the doing it myself is, um, is part of the work. Um, mm -hmm. My grandfather in Nigeria was a tailor and my mum was a seamstress. She taught us all to sew. So we're all quite crafty, you know, um, we, mm -hmm. we, we're very good with our hands. And for me, that's a big part of the work is cutting it out. I've, I have a couple of times in the past had a couple of um, kind of ex-students come to my studio and assist me in making the work, but that's very rare. And, and I don't want to have to have, look over their shoulder and do it again. So I'd rather just take longer to do it myself. If you see what right, I mean. right, yeah. Well, um, I want to I want to end with one more question. It's a it's a wonderful question. Um, I think on which to close, and and that is, um, someone is wondering when you decided to become an artist. Oh gosh, um, I think I always wanted to be when I was quite small. Um, my sister and I just used to sit at the kitchen table and make things in the summer holidays from like, from the age of nine onwards. Um, and I used to tell people that I was gonna be an artist, but I didn't know what that meant. You know, it was just like, all I knew was I liked making things out of lollipop sticks and straws. I didn't know <laughs> what it would mean. But it's interesting though, because a lot of the things that I do now as an artist are kind of based on the things I used to do as a child. Hmm. You know, we used to, we used to cut out paper dolls in a string and you know hold them out like yeah. that and all that those kind of things um so i have never done anything else i as soon as i was um at the right age i went to college and it's all kind of just carried on foundation to ba to ma and you just carried on from there i've always been an artist yeah yeah that's wonderful well mary thank you so much this is been an absolute treat and i am very eager to um Go down to the museum and unwrap your work and yeah, great. in person. Great. I'm um, looking forward to seeing it. Yes, we will, we will certainly be in touch yeah. about the installation. Yeah, great. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Carolyn, did you have any closing remarks? Just wanted to uh, second that thanks, Mary, for taking the time with us this evening for you um, to to get to talk about your work and 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 see hear about it directly from you is really wonderful and inspirational and and I think Maureen said something was delivered so uh, we're excited to um, quick wow yeah, yeah so uh, so yeah so we're we're just so excited to see it in person and and get to 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 learn more about you. Um, so thank you everyone who attended today as well, um, especially to our UK committee as uh, Jenny and Mary have stated, just a special thank you to them for all that you've done with the with Women to Watch and, and with the museum and for all of our committees, we thank you.